I draw a lot of analogies between being a founder and startup life dating, whether it's meeting investors and it's just like going on dates. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it doesn't work out. But are you a bad person or was it just not a good fit? Welcome to the Startup Defense. Today, I have Matt Bilski of Flex Solutions. Matt, we met through a mutual friend of ours, Jade Garrett, and she's been on the show. We got to talking and we actually were able to share dinner at an event that you were up here in kind of my neck of the woods, which you won something. So we'll get into that. But before we talk about winning funding and what you're doing, I, I I want everyone to hear the saga. Who is Matt with a saga of Flex Solutions? Because it gives some really good gravity to what it takes to create innovation. You're know, going after different markets, and now you've hit a market that's close to my heart, and you've gotten some traction in that. It wasn't an overnight. You came up with an idea, and then just magically were working with the Navy. So we'll set that as an endpoint, and then can you walk us through? Who are you? What are you doing? What are you passionate about right now? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a, a hell of a prompt and a heck of an intro, so I appreciate it. Happy to tell the story, although as I like to joke, when they write the book about Flex, it's probably only the last couple of years that they'd even start the book at, let alone you know the other close to a decade I've been working on this technology. But yeah, so for everybody out there who I haven't met yet, uh, my name is Matt Bilski, founder and CEO here at Flex Solutions. And I guess my story starts usually the way I, I've always kind of been an inventor, innovator, that sort of thing. Growing up, my first companies when I was 13 or so, start fixing computers for people, doing IT stuff, being a handyman. So, oh, okay, someone needs a fence or whatever. So I'd go around, my parents would drop me off, and I'd go and fix people's things and go hang tags on people in the neighborhood. Hey, you got a computer issue? I'll come and fix it. And ended up here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania to go to Lehigh University. Came here as a undergrad and fast forwarding through some of the highlight, you know, the, the details here. But basically going into my junior year, moved into an off-campus house uh, like many of us do. And at the time was working to fill my summers with more gainful employment than just river guiding and uh, fixing some stuff here or there on the side. And so I went to the landlords that I just uh, you know, moved in with and said, hey, you need any help fixing these houses? And they said, well, we don't really need any help fixing the houses, but we could use somebody to clean because we're turning over all these properties from the old college students to the new ones. So go scrub toilets, quite literally. And things were broken and nobody had the tools to fix them. But I did. So I was like, oh, we need to fix this. I ran back to the house, grabbed what I needed, started fixing things. So very quickly went from just scrubbing to, yes, I had to still scrub here or there, but actually becoming the rare, uh, you know, their superintendent. So at the time they had about uh, seven, eight properties. And over the next five years, I grew them to about 35 in an apartment building. It was really interesting because it was a couple of guys, childhood friends who really saw the opportunity here in, in Bethlehem to grow high quality student housing. And so I was really their first person that wasn't the two of them that they gave keys to. And, you know, here I am, you know, junior, senior in college, uh, fixing what drunk kids broke. And every once in a while I'd be at that party too. So it was like kind of a win-win. It was no, I didn't break it. I didn't create my own work, but it was a good way to uh, earn some beer money in college. Every time you know we buy a new property, we would renovate it. And uh, I would generally be the one who come in and do the punch lists and, and kind of tidy everything up at the end and do all of the, the you know, in-between stuff that the contractors tended to neglect. And every time we finished that renovation, they'd be like, hey, we forgot to run a wire. And I'm really good at old work electric. Well, I was trying to earn my beer money and have time to spend it. So it's like, you know, last week this floor was up and now I have to instead figure out a way to fish wires underneath this. Fast forward a little bit. So do this junior, senior year, finish out my undergrad in mechanical engineering and um, I had an opportunity to come on and go to grad school. That first couple of opportunities didn't quite work out, but basically created my own reality of I was had a full PhD funded with a faculty member. And I wasn't passionate about the work and just wasn't the right fit. And I definitely took that job for the money. My original grad school plan fell through. Kind of somebody told me about this. And this is the, the same person who taught me what the word mechatronics is. For those of you out there who don't know what mechatronics is, I'm a mechatronics person. Uh, mechatronics is the intersection of mechanical, electrical, computer engineering. And some people put programming and control systems on top of that as well. But the way I kind of also explain what mechatronics is, is take a car, right? A car is a mechatronic system. You have the gears and the motor, that mechanical part, 
you, then you have the electrical system, whether it's the battery, the charger, uh, you know, all the power distribution and all of that. And then you have the software, whether it's the infotainment system or the cruise control. And a fun fact that I like from a few years ago was that there's more lines of code in a car than a 747. Another parenthesis on this, 747s are more you know, cable, older technology. So I don't think that's necessarily the same for a 777, 787, but there's a lot of software in a car. So if you're saying, oh, I want to build a system, it's the Mechatronics person that makes this a reality. And so, you know, this faculty member told me what I'd always been doing with my life of tinkering, teaching myself how to solder and program and all of this that you know, I was always self-taught. Um, he said, no, you're a Mechatronics person. I'm like, oh, okay. Then electrical minor and he was the one who was trying to get me into grad school, but couldn't figure out the funding. So had that job with that professor for a semester. And I remember to this day, he got a call uh, from the department chair asking me to go uh, help teach the, I guess, the first year programming class. And then I had this epiphany. That teaching position comes with full tuition, full stipend. For those unfamiliar grad school, it's 20 hours a week is all you're allowed to work. And you work those 20 hours a week doing something and you get your full tuition, full everything. So if I was teaching 20 hours a week, and that was giving me my full tuition, full stipend, then any research I did on top of that would be, for all intents and purposes, volunteering. So if I'm going to do unpaid research, why am I working on somebody else's project instead of what I wanted? This is a novel concept. So I went around and I found the head of the entrepreneurship program in the engineering college, then became my PhD advisor, John Oaks. And I said, hey, John, why can't I teach my way through a PhD and start a company and, and do what I want to do? And he said, well, why can't you? This was uh, May, June 2013. That's when the journey that brought me to this conversation really started. And so I left my traditional fully funded PhD. You do your time, you publish, you go through for, okay, I'm going to have funding one to two semesters at a time as a teaching assistant. And I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do. I have somebody advising me through this process. But as he said to me explicitly, I'm not your dad. I'm not your boss. I'm not your coach, you know, it's on you to drive this. I will advise you through the process and, you know, help guide me. Here I am, been working as a landlord and I full-time in the summer fixing houses. So I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to start? What am I going to focus on to get a mechanical engineering PhD? So it's got to be novel enough to actually go through because I have to do all the core classes, all the stuff to get this PhD, but it's got to be mine and something I'm passionate about. But working as that landlord, I kept thinking about every time we needed to go behind the walls or look under the floor, look in the ceiling, all this pain in the butt stuff I had to deal with. I said, well, why am I doing this? Why isn't there some robot that we can put in through an outlet sized hole and have it drive through the wall and drill through every stud and joist along the way? That is what we now know as Flex Solutions. And in this odd turn of events, you know, John, when he was in grad school, was a union electrician. And for him, he was working at Newark Airport many, many years ago. And his job as an early journeyman was to make sure nobody changing the light bulbs got frostbite out in the freezing cold when we used to have winters here on the east. It really resonated with him as well. And so I figured out this way that teach my way through the PhD, but one of my many isms is read the directions, you know, read the manual. If you teach your way through grad school, you pay for all your own research, and you use resources commonly available to all students, you own that IP. Figure out a way to start a company, get a free PhD, and own all the patents. So stayed on, uh, you know, Grad school was about four, four and a half years, finished, defended, I guess, end of 2016, and then stayed on as a faculty member at Lehigh for a couple of years teaching the senior design there before leaving to go into startup life full time at the end of 2018. So Jan 1st, 2019, first day in this room as full time startup, quit my job, let's figure it out. And there was really this notion as I was on the way out the door, August, September, of 2018. Up until then, I've been focused on this snake robot that put it in. Imagine it climbing through. And so this drilling robot, drill through studs, joists. I figured it all out how to do it. Be this kind of expensive thing and need some more, many more years of development to actually get the locomotion. And that's where I really had the, I'd say, core epiphany that led to the modern incarnation of the Flexbot. And that is, well, what if we kept the price down and built this low cost tool? And this was right when Prusa 
had the Mark III, and it was my first 3D printer that just worked. And so this notion of just being able to print parts and what if we 3D printed? What if we just made this more prosumer style of robot rather than this expensive robot? And that's this paradigm of when you make robotics affordable, it becomes masterful and really changes out the whole market opportunity. And similarly, you know, 2019 got into a startup accelerator with Comcast Labs and was out there in 2020. And that was also when we kind of pivoted away from this notion of robots driving themselves to what can we do with just somebody holding this? And all of this is now what we know here is the Flexbot. The Flexbot's this one inch diameter snake-like robot uh, made up of all these identical links. They all have cameras and lights. And this is one link here, but typically you'd have three to five in a system. And users are able to insert it, have it bend to avoid all these obstacles along the way. And we can put different tools on the end, like I don't know, 360 cameras, you name it. And imagine it doesn't just have to be handheld like this, but on the end of a 20-foot pole. This notion still of, I just got to get in there. I just got to see this. But even just the worker being able to do this. So this notion of keeping the price down and really the minimum viable product, right? What is a engineering problem versus a PhD problem? Like we look at self-driving and the many milestones yet to be hit despite all the money and time put into that. And so where's Will Wheel Flex going to hit that? And so that's really now where we were focused in on you know, portable robotics, cobotics, the worker kind of using this. And that kind of takes us into a whole product market fit journey that I'm sure we'll probably end up getting into as well. One thing that I'll say about you, Matt, is that you're an energetic person. So you're really into not just your idea, but the idea of your idea of, about developing it and executing it and what it can do in, in the market. So it's always it, it's always awesome to hear how excited you are in your voice about Flex and about just the process of it. What were some unexpected differences between moving from that academic environment into, say, other programs or into the general commercial environment? I had such an interesting academic experience in, you know, my since my doctoral work itself was focused on you know, starting a company. So then, and I was teaching through, I really got involved in entrepreneurial engineering education. So teaching development, how we actually get students engaged. So a lot of my conference work and all was on engineering education and how we, and entrepreneurial engineering education, being an entrepreneur on the side in a room full of tenured faculty. And it, so it was really kind of interesting seeing how, you know, that world works and this world works. And I think the lines are getting more and more blurred, but I've always maintained that they're actually very similar. And I, I see over your shoulder, they're good to great, which is one of my favorite business books. And they really talk about this, you know, the hedgehog concept, right? Uh, what can you be the best in the world at? What drives your economic engine and what are you deeply passionate about? As the core of a great business, really faculty and their research groups are kind of like their own business entities in and of themselves. I pitch investors here. They pitch tenure boards there, chasing grants, chasing funding, both kind of going here. So there's a lot of similarities, but there's also a lot of differences. And I'd say one of the toughest things that I had to learn, you look at programs like i -Corps for the NSF, whose mandate essentially is taking basic research and translating it into businesses to hold and try to go SBIR and all that. And there, you know, you, you kind of go through that and there's the NSF realized, how do we take faculty mindset and teach them about entrepreneurship and value props and this sort of thing? And all of that kind of boils down to, pardon the crudeness on this, of, nobody gives a shit about your tech. And that was probably one of the hardest lessons I've had to learn and I think is so important in the entrepreneurship side. Whereas, you know, in academia, it's really a lot about what you're working on. What is this novel thing you've created and validating that thing for its own merits? This algorithm is new because it could do this and here's this metric or this process is new. And so it's all kind of about the invention itself. Whereas on the business side, the invention doesn't matter. It's the value. It's the value prop. And what comes out of that, in a lot of ways, people just assume it works, right? Yes, there's due diligence and headlines on both sides of whether or not they do. But there's that kind of underlying of, I have this black box widget that does magic. Well, what does that magic do for somebody? And that's what they care about. Well, someday somebody asked me about how my motors work or how the code works or 
these sort of things at an investor meeting. But that's not what they're worried about. One of the things in, in this, the words what versus how, right? I, I would say what is very much startup entrepreneurial, how you do it is still more of that development, could be thought of more maybe on the academic side, the process, how this thing works versus what does it do for me and the target specs and those sort of things. Yeah, we'd say objective versus subjective value or novelty. So in the commercial market or in business, it's the market itself gets to decide whether we have a good idea or not. If it's novel to them, it is from their perception versus our internal perception. Whereas academically, we're searching for something that is new territory from a patent or research perspective. It is objectively novel. Uh, hopefully, it is objectively valuable. Whereas in business, objective value has no bearing. Otherwise, products would be like all 5% of what their build materials cost would be. You know, and that's just not the case of how anything works. I have seen a blurring of the lines between the education that's happening in universities. We work with a number of the local universities. They've had more and more programs, whereas when I went through college, that stuff didn't exist and it was super frustrating to me because it's like, okay, I'm trying to get a computer science degree, but I already professionally code. Having people that have never made a software product tell me that I don't know what I'm doing, but they don't do it. And it's similarly down the line, well, I want to actually get this done. So what does it look like to run a software team? And they're like, well, I, I don't know. This is a class on algorithms. I value that, but also it's not solving a problem that I truly value right now. And then now I'm seeing more project or work experience or even entrepreneurial level education in computer science, in engineering, in cross STEM education in general. What can we actually do with this? Because math becomes fun when you make a robot move. Vector calculus isn't going to get me excited otherwise. When I was talking about having gotten involved in, in entrepreneurial engineering education, that insight that you just had was what we were basically, I'll call it pioneering in a lot of ways. This shift from guru professor just lecturing to a room full of people to, you know, a lot of research has been coming out on active collaborative learning and project-based learning, problem-based learning. And we kind of had ended up terming that all together as entrepreneurial minded learning. So this notion of framing math, right? And we could go on a lot of these different rabbit holes, but as somebody who, unlike my peers when I was a faculty member and my professors when I was a student, I don't see math the way mathematicians do. I fundamentally can do it. I get it and all this, but math for math's sake versus when you get to learn through the project and that, and then the outcomes that kind of come out of all of that, it, it all does combine in a much better way. And then one of the other things I, I wanted to kind of talk about with this sort of merging of academia and that I actually had given a talk on my way out to the faculty and the grad students on if we look at higher ed and especially graduate school, there's some great articles that basically the average professor graduates something like eight PhD students in their lifetime. And then there was another article out of like NIH basically framing it as think about a professor graduating a PhD as like giving birth to a child, right? So each faculty member has eight children throughout their career. Well, only one of those children can replace that faculty member as a professor at that university. And while yes, college rates have gone up, it hasn't been exponential growth to the rate of one to eight. So the mass majority of graduate students, whether it be masters or PhDs, and fundamentally that undergraduates are not going into basic research at an academic institution, right? They're going out into industry, whether it's industrial research or just becoming a great member of an organization. As education's adapting, I think we're starting to see this more and more, it has to meet these students, regardless of undergrad, master's, PhD, and better prepare them for the fact that they're going to end up most likely in industry as opposed to pure academic. We found a common tie that one of your students is actually a, a friend of mine and done some advising for Altor Locks, right? The giant lock. And that came out of that education and almost for Dylan, like, this is something I developed while I was in school, or the concept of this is something that I developed 
while I was in school and then to see how you know, he's gone viral, he's done some crowdfunding and he's been around for a while. So by all normal measures, a fairly successful entrepreneur with a great product, seeing that effectiveness, I think with the traditional academic approach, there would be very few people that are graduating as mechanical engineers with a business that is selling thousands of products online. So yeah. whatever you're up to, it seems to be working because Dylan had good results and good things to yeah, say. Yeah, measure me based on that one data point because that's a great data point. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the only data point that I have. But right, I think, exactly. I think a data point that uh, we both have many more things to sample from is looking at both academic institutions and then programs that are out there to like help startups and how many of them are ineffectual because they're run by people without venture experience. They're really run as here's some YouTube videos or here is some information. I really see it's a different flavor of the same parallel. Is I don't want to be lectured to. I'm a bad fit for a traditional academic environment, probably the worst fit that you could get. And then as I've gone out and worked with startups, worked with people like yourself, and been a mentor in a lot of programs or help people launch their programs or sat in and been upstream, downstream of those locally, nationally, including ICAP and ICOR, so I'll put that on the table as well, is the results aren't very great. And I think that the, we can draw a common line between activating somebody to take action in both of those settings, but you've been a member of a number of different programs. And so I kind of wanted to hear your take on this from, because you've gone from academic programs and then you've gone through, you know, several accelerators, several different groups or consultancies or however you want to flavor that. What's your take on this? Yeah. And it's funny you, you, you bring that up because it's something that I've always myself wondered. I guess the question of a phrase that always pops in my head that I've heard, nascent entrepreneur. And I always thought about the programs we were doing and what percent of people did we change versus they didn't know they could do it, but we we unlocked that in them versus didn't know anything and taught them from scratch. It's interesting, right? Because fundamentally there's that question, can entrepreneurship be taught, right? Is there a process? You go back to like Steve Blank's work, right? On like, no, Kim, <laughs> that's my answer. Yeah. My answer was no, it, it, it has to be experienced and somebody becomes this new identity of it through experience, but <laughs> sorry, but well, yeah, just... And I think that's, I 100% agree that there is no lecture that can teach entrepreneurship, All right, So it's through the act of doing it, right? You can get the concepts, you can get ready, but it's project-based learning, whether it's academic or the project of starting a company, you kind of need to go through that. I'm not an Elon Musk fan boy, and there's a lot of stuff he says that I think is somewhere, but one of, my, one of the quotes I heard that I thought was a good one was, if you have to ask yourself, you should be an entrepreneur or not, the answer is no. It's one of those things that it's all consuming. But as I'm telling you this, something that just popped in my head, because I draw a lot of analogies between being a founder and startup life and all of this and dating, whether it's meeting investors and it's just like going on dates. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it doesn't work out. But are you a bad person or was it just not a good fit? Should I quit what I'm doing or it just wasn't a good impedance match? And so there's a lot of these. What popped in my head was parenting, right? I'm not a parent, but my understanding is, you know, a lot of people are parents and there's no prep for that. Maybe you raised a younger sibling or whatever, but for the most part, nobody practiced that, yet they do it. And in a lot of ways, I kind of described, you know, my snake robot here is, you know, it's kind of like my kid. When I was meeting my partner, it was like, cool, you got to date me and this company and this robot that takes up all my time is what I think about is kind of, you know, kid comes first, robot comes first. Oh, either I'm doing something for flex. And if there's no flex things, then I can go do something with my friends. And, you know, that sort of notion of, I always thought of my snake-like robot as my child. And so drawing this analogy out, just totally off the cuff here of people are parents without all of this training and practice. And they just figure it out by doing it. And so maybe that is the answer that I, on the one hand, I want to say that, like, I can't teach you how to have that motivation or how to care. But on the other hand, 
I can't teach you how to be a parent yet. For the most part, I'd say most people are at least average, if not better. I think it is something that people can try. Some will succeed more than others, but fundamentally, I think the underlying thing is that that drive, that ability to persevere and just when the going gets tough, the entrepreneur keeps going and everybody else just go gets a regular job. You know, I, I, I don't know if you can teach tenacity, but tenacity can be learned from any number of life paths. Let's talk about tenacity because I don't like to use the word pivot or evolve or things, things like that, but it is natural over the course of bringing a product to market that you get progressively less wrong, right? We as entrepreneurial scientists can disprove a lot of our hypothesis and find a way that we get a better fit with what we're trying to do. And I know that you started in the construction market and that comes from personal experience. So it's intuitive. It's natural that you would approach that market first. When we initially talked, you were exploring new markets in manufacturing. More recently, you've had some traction and success in my core market, which, you know, defense. I see what you're doing. And I also know that the Navy is pushing really, really hard in on-ship robotics to get more than just maintenance done. So it seems like you have additional opportunities. Is, they're literally publishing, hey, we want solutions that can do X, Y, Z. Anything that needs to get done on a battleship or on a submarine or on an X, we want a robot that can do it. Who's got it? I saw this article. I thought, Man, I'll send it to Matt, but he's probably already seen this. Can we talk about tenacity a little bit and what that process of going market to market and honing in on specific opportunities looks like or looked like for you? Great setup there. And I mean, I definitely have not the easiest of entrepreneurial journeys and we're in a lot of ways still at the beginning, but also have a ton of knowledge. In other aspects of my life, I've had to learn tenacity. I, I had a lot of health issues early on in my life and I still have some things that I just have to fight through. And so I know for me, that gave me this general disposition of sick days don't exist. Any pain that goes away within the next six weeks isn't that bad. Right. <laughs> you know, but six and stones break my bow. It's kind of true. In six weeks, your broken arm's not gonna hurt anymore, but we could argue emotional pain's a whole different story. But fundamentally, I had to learn as an individual how to just keep on keeping on. I know I wouldn't be here without that. Right over there is 36 notebooks, each with 220 pages. That's the majority of notes. And now I finally went digital, but I've been at this a while and working hard and, and just keeping going. And I don't know how to articulate it. I know it's just kind of who I am that I want to succeed, but I don't want to fail even more than I want to succeed. I don't like being told no. And I think it came from, I know part of it at least was other things in my life. People were telling me no, and I had no control over it. So anytime I have the, the choice to just prove myself wrong, prove something, or just keep fighting forward, that's what I do. And I think that's what I'm not going to say all entrepreneurs do because some people get lucky. It's, oh, we, we did a couple of things, boom, boom, boom. It just worked out. Or there's different entrepreneurial journeys, whether it's being asked by your company to leave, start a company and have them be your first customer. That's a very different startup journey than mine of, I don't know anybody. I got to pick this up as I go along. And I'd say kind of two main transitions we had. One was, I alluded to earlier, of Originally, and we even have patents around the ability of this robot to climb and move and locomote. And while that ultimately has a huge application in terms of business, that's not where we start. So there was this, okay, let's get okay with this notion of I'm not building a walking robot today, a self-driving robot. I could build a hell of a lot of value with just a handheld flex spot on a pole or something like that. So that was kind of the first understanding. And we were really in this construction real estate market. So we spoke to everybody from top three multi-billion dollar construction companies across the world who were like, this is great. We love it. To folks coming in inbound and, you know, got a lot of people telling me I was pretty. I think my kindergarten or first grade teacher also told me I was going to be president one day. This is what they say to make you feel good. But it's not factually based on, okay, that's kind of their role is to make you feel good and, and feel passionate about this. And so we got a lot of 
this would be awesome. And people would talk. So we had a lot of anecdotal excitement. But one of the phrases I've learned as I've transitioned things in life is uh, you can take it to heart, but you can't take it to the bank. And so it's like, this is great. And we can go back to this construction real estate when the price point is lower and it kind of falls into that nice to have. But we couldn't find the hair on fire, time is money problem. And kept going around in this circle of, and still to this day, there's people who are excited about this in AEC, architect, engineering, construction, like that whole area. And ultimately we'll get back to it. But it came a point, actually, this is part of where having networks, mentors, and meeting people, having good advisors. And one of our advisors was like, look, man, I've had startups in this. Trust me, find something different. And it's pretty hard many, many years down the road to basically be like, okay, I'm back to a solution looking for a problem. And the world's my oyster, but spoken to hundreds, if not a thousand people across name an industry or something, I've probably spoken to at least one, if not more people who work in that industry and know their problems. So we had to go out and really start at day one and just start talking to people. And, you know, I was fortunate to bring on some folks that are really good at this. And, you know, we had a woman, Natalie, who specialized in a lot of this talking to folks and design of experiments. She kind of helped lead the charge on this front talking to folks. And so we really dug in further on the construction real estate and understood that when we're at that like 1500 bucks, which is not that far out, but it's not the first hundred, we can get back to them and we have all that. But what else is there? And it's really interesting to explore the economics of industries fundamentally. And time is money. And one of my number one rules of robotics is, unfortunately, never underestimate the cheapness of human labor. There's a lot of things that people are not making that much money doing. So you save them 15 minutes a week. Their time is not worth that much. And so I could save you 500 bucks a year. A robot's just not going to make sense for that. And so we had to go through a number of industries and you, know, you pull on every single thread. I think that's one of the, my rules of entrepreneurship is meet everybody I can, go to everything, just try to connect the dots and you know try to leave a call with two people if I met one. And so, you know, we, we went down all of these and where we really honed in is this industrial facility maintenance, specifically things like manufacturing and high availability. So continuous processes and in industries like manufacturing, the average manufacturer has between 38 and 40 hours of downtime a month. And that averages out in cost to like 4,000 bucks a minute. So if I have a flex spot that's, you know, 10K to start, I just saved you three minutes. We paid for this whole system. Instantly, we found time is money. We found a bunch of folks, the maintenance technicians, who are faced with that exact same problem I had of can't get where I need to get, can't see what I need to do. They got to get in this machinery that wasn't designed, just I got to get in this wall that wasn't designed for me. And at the end of the day, really thinking back to where this all started, I was a superintendent of properties. I was a maintenance tech. I wasn't building the property from scratch. I wasn't going down to the studs with the renovation. I was coming in and doing the maintenance on it. And so it does feel very full circle in a lot of ways going to maintenance techs. It's just which maintenance tech is it? And that's where, whether it's manufacturing, places like airports, you look at an airport like Heathrow, 99% utilization. So there is no extra time. All this downtime adds up. So being able to help on the one side with everybody trying to do more preventative maintenance, but everybody's short-staffed and this stuff wasn't designed. So can we go find leaks in systems before they blow up or do thermal analysis on bearings all without ladders, which are the most dangerous thing on any work site. And then also like in a lot of situations, you need two people to climb a ladder, one to hold it, one to climb it and going up and down takes time. So we have all these ways we can help with preventative and this shift in industry 4.0 to predictive. So we're collecting this data, feed it into algorithms and not just hear a leak, but look at vibrations and stuff and be able to predict what's going to happen. And then where the flexbot really can shine is when inevitably it doesn't matter how much preventative maintenance you do, things eventually go down, right? And so can we just shorten the diagnostic time when that whole plant is down? Think of a paper mill or a lumber mill or something like that where logs come in. Some of these places have four or 500 trucks a day. 
If that one conveyor belt goes down at the entrance, everything downstream is shut down. You know, you and I have talked a bunch about like machine shops and stuff. And at first glance, it's like, okay, well, if one CNC machine goes down, that's bad. But typically you have a number of work cells, so you're not 100% shut down. But as I look at a lot of machine shops out there, a lot of them have one compressor, maybe two, and probably one air loop that all those machines are attached to. And I have known from my own time in the machine shop, when that air pressure cuts, that machine E stops with the tool in your part, no matter where you were, usually at the worst time. And so there is a way for one week to take down an entire machine shop. So these notions of where you can have these domino effects, we can come in and A, help prevent, help recover quicker. And so it's been really interesting to actually have this. Time is money, people excited. And well, yes, it's really hard to start over. We've been in this since I'd say probably April of this year. And having spent a few years building up a large Rolodex of VCs, corporate innovation, partners, you name organizations in the construction real estate space. And what got us connected was meeting Jade through, uh, we were one of three winners in the robot prize for building envelope retrofits. We were working with the world's largest architecture firm and a major construction company out of California, you know, so Gensler, Skyline Capital Partners, and a startup, uh, Lamar AI. So we won you know, over a million dollars in the Department of Energy to use the FlexBot to do things in construction, but they were a little bit down the road, right? So I had to walk away from all of that and start from scratch and basically go back to my network and say, hey, you're here, but do you know anybody over here? Connect those dots. And so we're still in the process of building that up. But we went from, I think I'd like to have a flex bond in construction too. I would pay a hundred grand for that tomorrow. People really getting it and the economics working out. Yeah, the pivot really sucks for lack of a better word because well, there's two alternatives, right? Pivot, fail, or have succeeded already. One of those other options, it would have been great to have just hit it out of the park on the first try, but that didn't happen. So left with the options of fail or pivot. Is it really a pivot or is it an evolution? What do people in manufacturing want to do? Well, some of them also have to go and find the leak above the ceiling. Some of them have to go and do. So there's a lot of overlap. It's that understanding of what we do and how we phrase it and really just who the first person is, but it all kind of connects in. And yeah, I'm happy to continue the conversation over to the defense side because that's kind of an independent story that's also kind of mirroring this. It's a process of exploring value. And going back to our earlier point is that value is subjective, right? It's experienced by someone else. Our value is in the solution and it's solving what? It's a bucket of X. And so if I have a bakery and I need to inspect inside of a bagel oven, well, it's very difficult to do. And so that one inspection routine might pay for your robot. Whereas if I'm a home remodeler, I get paid per job, honestly, and I could just hire somebody. And if I need, need I'm not going to get two robots. I'm going to get three people. At the end of the day, it's doing the same thing. And in my experience, because hardware is expensive to develop, which I really like because we're building our entrepreneurial moat. It's just as expensive for everybody else to follow. In my experience, there's always a 1, 10, and 100x value application for any idea. And usually people approach their ideas from a 0.5 or 0.8 X, where they look at it and say, there's this product, but we can be cheaper than all of the competition in the same exact market. And that's inherently can't possibly be true because when you dive into the analytics of those businesses, most of the time they're not really making money on the product in the first place. And they have millions and millions of dollars worth of funding and huge teams. So like, how are you going to slingshot past those financial issues and then be cheaper than them and stay in business. Whereas, yeah, go to manufacturing where there's a clear demonstrable value that you can attach and you can put numbers and you can pull numbers from them and generally manufacturers of some kind of reasonable or credible size are good at knowing their numbers because it's a operations business. You have to understand operations to exist. Right. And then in defense, if manufacturing is 10x, defense would be 100x 
for certain applications because it's a life or death thing or it's just flat out impossible otherwise. So if I have to make 10 flex bots instead of 10,000, I know that it can't be $1,500. It's got to be $15,000. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm not going to sell that to a, a GC. Maybe one day I will, but who is going to be my beachhead customer where they're absolutely pumped to buy a $15,000 flex bot? And it's never my primary market or it's never the first thing that people come to us with, but I'm super biased. So you don't have to listen to me about defense. In general, I find that any problem that's experienced by industry is experienced in defense, but just at a 10x level. Getting it in front of somebody, getting a demo is really hard in certain industries, it's like very difficult. So dealing with especially data or financial data or healthcare, getting in front of people has taken a really long time to develop relationships where I can get startups in front of a healthcare provider. That's not easy. Whereas in defense, there's just competitions, right? right? There's open calls, there's rodeos, road shows, showcases, demo days, private invites, and, and competitions. It's a lot more accepting or porous than other industries. It, it is interesting. I'd say like the various roadblocks and things like that, when you look at different industries and people are like, the things you'd assume would be hard are actually sometimes easy and vice versa. And it's like, oh, such and such has... XYZ regulation, but then they also have very well developed sandboxes for you to play in. Getting the foot in the door is fundamentally whatever it is you're trying to do, the hardest thing for most people. Unfortunately, the gatekeeper for a lot of people changing what they do. And as an entrepreneur, fundamentally, we're walking the fine line between sales and learning, especially with the earliest conversations. I'm trying to learn. I just want to get on the phone with you to learn. For the most part of this journey, I couldn't even give you a flex spot if you want it. I'm not here to sell you because I have nothing to sell you. I'm here to learn from you and understand and better these sort of things. But nevertheless, still getting your foot in the door is not trivial. And I guess you kind of teed me up well for how we ended up in defense. One of my learnings, I think we've kind of intersected stories here so many ways of having not been a traditional academic, also not being somebody chasing basic NSF grants or even SBIR grants for, uh, at, at this point in our journey. But what we have found, and I think the, the first one that really hits the nail on the head for us was the story of Jade and the Department of Energy's e-robot prize for building envelope retrofits. It was a prize. It was a competition. And that was really eye-opening of this is not I submit a proposal for 10 pages. They wait nine months to decide if I did the margins correctly to then pass it off to the next person to review. And then eight months later, I find out if I got it or didn't. And then I have to wait 12 months for the money to go to some institute versus the challenge. Yeah. Two, three months, you could get $50,000 for effectively a video and a pitch deck, which is, it, it's non-dilutive funding, no strings attached. Ridiculous. Exactly. Wired transfer to your bank account. And it's really interesting. By the way, for those of you out there who are in Congress, if you don't mind bringing back the old R&D tax credit, that'd be great. This challenge that just changed us. So we had those two. And then- Again, networking people, you never knew you know, who you're going to meet and met folks at Ensign, who National Security Innovation Network. And, you know, we'd applied to a couple of their programs. And I was at, there's an annual robotics event, the Cascadia Connect out in Pittsburgh, and just was sitting on a bench next to somebody and started talking to the woman, Liz, and turns out she worked for them. And she's like, there's this challenge coming up called Navy Tank Inspection. You should look at that. And I'll be honest, we looked at it and we saw the title and we said, we don't swim. We're not currently waterproof yet. This does not necessarily seem like the thing for us. But the application, you know, the first round was fairly, you know, innocuous to put together. So we, we put in the application, got to pitch. And the next thing you know, we're getting paid $10,000 to go on the USS Midway aircraft carrier to go and do a demonstration in a ballast tank on that aircraft carrier. And so you know, show up for that with the bot. I'd never been in a ballast tank. I'd never been on an aircraft carrier. And I just knew that we had three hours to go and find corrosion in this tank. So we brought the bot. We had our 3D mapping head. So we were able to kind of make a map of the area. And then we were able to identify the different areas of corrosion in there and kind of show this is it. But going into it, you know, in the back of my mind, and I guess this is that entrepreneurial spirit or that 
tenacity of, okay, so we're here to do this, but hopefully there'll be some other opportunities for us to do what we know we're better at, right? Because I go, my goal going there was, I don't think I'm going to win ballast tank inspection because I know there's robots out there that do tank inspection. That is their core competency. But I do know I have the best robot for everything but ballast tank inspection. And even then, we can help in a way that I carry this on a plane. I just show up with my little thing. The people needed to bring a crane to get their thing implemented. So for us, we show up, we do it. And then we were pretty fortunate in that it was a museum ship. And they said, well, you're here. Go and do whatever the heck you want. Okay. So next thing you know, we, we, we had our extension poles with us. We're busy inspecting above the HBC systems in the on the hangar bay. And people attending the museum just start watching us. We start getting this whole circle around. And so people from the, you know, the other judges there start looking at, wow, this is awesome. And then the chief engineer comes out. And he's like, I've spent 20 years defending the U.S. to promote capitalism. I'm happy to help startups. This is awesome. All of these, he starts listing off all these things that he wished he could do with it. So then he takes us in and there's the cryo plant. He's like, oh, can you go and read this gauge? Oh, yeah. Then we go up to the hangar bay to the uh, flight deck and we're able to go in and look at aircraft and stuff like that. And so it was a great opportunity for us to just take advantage of us being there, get a lot of footage. Uh, you know, if you go on YouTube, our YouTube, you can see some of that stuff. What came out of that was we didn't win, but we did win best robot for everything but ballast tanks. So then met some folks who win shipyards. And next thing you know, all the shipyards is calling for us to go down because they want us. And then met folks who their job is to find folks like us and bridge it with the organizations like Tech Bridges. So working on proposals to get us to go and do non-destructive testing while things are out there so they better know what to do when it's in for service. And so then similarly, it's like, great, they tell you about the carrier team one to go and meet all the carrier folks that are maintaining the carrier fleet. And so go down there and meet more folks. And all of this kind of led up to this challenge where, you know, you and I got to meet in person. So down in the National Harbor for this part of the Tech Connect World Expo. And so it was the ATI Navy Man Tech or Maintenance Tech Advanced Manufacturing Challenge. And so, mind you, you know, we applied for this our first month in manufacturing. We're one of the finalists. I, I go get to pitch and... Or do you know that trophy right behind me says I won first place? And so it's like, okay, great. Well, then some of the judges are heads of innovation at the major shipyards that are building the fleet of tomorrow. And next thing you know, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be down in the shipyard with the Flexbot. And there's these opportunities for further funding. And so it's all kind of chipping away. But bringing this all full circle to tenacity and fighting, if those seeds you plant today, minimum six months, typically 12 months for them to bear fruit, right? Here we are in August, so almost a year from when we first just threw our hat, the Navy ring, to I will have been on two aircraft carriers in the last 12 months. I will go to at least two shipyards and hopefully many more. And all of this out of something that the 10K was cool, but that's not the grand prize, right? The grand prize is what we're finally starting to hit now. And that kind of validation of, in construction real estate, I was really good at getting in the top 10. So I got to go on stage, but I never was able to bring home the winner. First time pitching, you know, manufacturing and folks like that, they get it. But that was really, you know, gratifying in a lot of ways. And so excited to, you know, help on just kind of the, the two sides of this one. A lot of it is, as you kind of were mentioning, they want to do things during deployments. So being able to help support them and do better analysis out in the field, because when these ships come in, they don't, all these cost overruns are things we hear about. So can we help, you know, the project management side? And then the other side is, especially at the shipyards, is we're trying to turn more and more ships over. And there's some great 60 minute interviews and stuff like that around the Navy. And it's, I guess we'll call it the 2023 and beyond. And so can we help them better be able to check things before they call in for repairs? Because one of the things we're seeing is as we get a more diverse workforce out there, people are different shapes and sizes than they used to. And so people don't fit where they used to. And so now we need a way to enable people to get where they can't get so that they call the inspector the first time as opposed to five times and all these other things. And then safety, are we able to go and check these things and minimizing disruptions and then even supporting the plants themselves? So we're, I'd say, early yet accelerating in this journey. And while 
you know, our, our anecdotes to date have been on the Navy. We're pursuing some of these things coming down from the Air Force and Army and we can definitely help support a lot of these different, I guess, branches of the military. And so that's something that I'm really passionate about is us being dual use of we're able to support the defense industry, which, you know, is really great right now as we're going from first units to we need to rapidly produce the first batch. And that's something that the DOD is really good at helping to make happen of, great, this is a tech we want. We can be, SBIR calls themselves America's seed fund. I'll, I'm going to jokingly call DOD America's pre-seed fund. Like, you know, they can help get you across that kind of pipeline here. And then, of course, they can be a great SBIR phase three resource, right? A great end user. But at the same time, in parallel, especially at that seed level, that's where the commercial success and ultimately... I'm passionate about this company being successful commercially. If any one of these independently is successful, that's great. So then at both strike, we're even better off, right? So it's really looking at it of let's grow this dual use. So continuing down this high availability, manufacturing, and getting these in. And as one of the things, and I think you're kind of alluding to it with pricing earlier of, you know, we've been working on is how do we get the first hundred units sold at 10K? Everything else, price drops, scales down, and more and more markets open up. And so we have this great journey here, but then also being able to support the armed forces, the defense sector, and we benefit from that and they're able to benefit from us. So really excited about that aspect as well. Matt, thank you so much for spending time and being on the show and really breaking that down where you've been, where you're going and what those opportunities look like. I think that's incredibly helpful for the startup founders that are listening to the show. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Callie. I mean, wasn't sure where the conversation was going to go, but knowing you, I knew it was going to be a good talk. And I think that this is one of the more unique ways I've gotten to combine all aspects of this story. And I guess it's all retroactive. I now have some great things to tell, but really uh, appreciate the, the platform to share. Thank you. This has been the Startup Defense.